celestial navigation is not possible upon a spherical earth. Hey everyone, John the Morgyle here, checking in for a new Flat Earth video for you. I hope you do enjoy it. Uh, this is a pretty bold claim here about celestial navigation, and it necessitates one gaining a basic understanding of how celestial navigation is done in order to determine whether or not the claim is valid. And when I first heard the claim, I was skeptical for I honestly didn't understand the first thing about celestial navigation, and frankly, it seemed hard to grasp how all the mariners, ostensibly over the last few hundred years, believed they lived on a spherical world while somehow using celestial navigation, which is, according to this claim, only possible upon a planar world. In other words, if they believe the Earth to be a sphere, how is it possible for them to successfully utilize the techniques involved with celestial navigation in the first place? Well, the short answer is that celestial navigation requires triangulation or trigonometry, trigonometry requires triangles, and triangles require straight line edges, not curved ones, categorically so. Of course, when you see how celestial navigation actually requires a flat Earth, then you witness Globers clinging to the notion that such triangulation is possible upon a spherical Earth, the cognitive dissonance becomes obvious. So if you're going to try and find out where you are on the world or in the ocean, you're going to need a sextant to precisely measure the elevation angle or the altitude of a given star. You'll also need to know the exact date and time, and of course you'll need an accurate, detailed map as well. But a good sextant and a decent map are not going to be enough. You're going to need an astronomical almanac for the current year. Uh, without this key resource, even the best observations, measurements, and mathematical prowess won't do you any good, even if you do have a map, a compass, and an accurate clock. Okay, so the clock isn't 100% necessary as there are methods to determine the exact Greenwich Mean Time, uh, for example the lunar method without a clock, uh, but for the purposes of this video we'll just say you need an accurate clock too. So the Celestial Almanac, uh, again for the rudimentary purposes of this video, contains details about many easily identifiable stars and exactly where they'll be on a given date and time. Or maybe better stated than where they'll be, we should say the exact GP or geographical position of the star at any given date and time during that year. Uh, this is the key information that you'll need to determine your position relative to the GP of the selected stars based on the elevation angle of said visible stars with reference to this nautical almanac I just mentioned. So, once you've established the elevation angle for a given star, along with the current date and time, along with the nautical almanac to determine the current ground position of the star that you're viewing, and then your exact distance to that ground position based on aforementioned elevation angle using trigonometry. So, once you've established these, you have an accurate idea of your proximity to the GP of the given star. But that can be a very wide area, described as a great circle around the star's GP, which is called a circle of equal altitude, all depending on which star you're observing and its current elevation angle at the given date and time. See, this is what I never understood about celestial navigation, which finally clicked for me once I realized that the key was this nautical almanac. Again, you will need a firm grasp of astronomy in general, uh, you know, in order to determine one star from the other. Um, it is well documented in this almanac exactly where a given star will be in terms of its GP on any given date and time. Uh, but of course, you must determine the star's elevation angle, coupled with the current date and time, to establish your distance or your circle of equal altitude from the star. 
The term circle of equal elevation means that if you were standing at any point on this circle, the star in question would be the same altitude or the same elevation angle in the sky, whether you were, say, standing way over on the west side of the circle or even on the complete opposite east side of it. As a side note, isn't it amazing how predictable and cyclical the heavenly luminaries behave? I mean, in a heliocentric paradigm, the last thing one would expect for the heavens is for them to behave like clockwork. Given all the variables involved with the standard model, uh, the stars are supposedly in hypersonic orbital velocities, while the Earth, too, is supposedly adherent to the sun's galactic orbit, while the Earth spins around the sun off-kilter and wobbling, and yet the heavenly cycles are more perfectly predictable than clockwork. Truly amazing. Naturally, when considering the Flat Earth Hypothesis, this fact about the celestial luminaries' cyclical nature is not very surprising at all, while in the standard heliocentric model, such a thing is completely and totally counterintuitive. Anyways, once you've established the circle of equal altitude, which is a loaded phrase in my opinion, but again, has nothing to do with the altitude of the circle, but rather the altitude of the star would be the same from any point on that circumference, which could be hundreds or even thousands of miles around depending on the star and your distance to it. Once you've gleaned the line of position, which is really just a small segment of that circle we just mentioned, you would set out to observe another star, measure its altitude and azimuth or elevation angle and cardinal direction to establish a second circle of equal elevation for the GP of the second star. Now, when you trace a circle around the GP of that second star, it should intersect or overlap with the circle of equal elevation of the first star, narrowing down your actual position on the world with each and every star that you apply to this process. The more stars you observe and plug in, the more accurate your position on the world becomes. Bada bing, bada boom, Bob's your uncle, and now you're celestial navigating, and that's the long and short of it. Uh, sure, it gets way more complex than this basic overview, but hopefully now we can understand how celestial navigation is simply mutually exclusive to a spherical Earth and demands a planar surface for the baseline of 90 degree triangles used to determine the circle of equal altitude around the GP of the star. If you were to try to apply this logic towards a globe, you would find that you cannot get a 90 degrees to the GP of the star on a spherical Earth. It just simply cannot be. Again, the key part of this process, which is exclusive to flat Earth and simply couldn't work on a sphere, is the fact that trigonometry used to determine your distance from the GP of the star in question relies upon a 90 degree angle adjacent to the ground. In simple terms, you cannot have a 90 degree angle adjacent to a curved edge. The only reason celestial navigation works is because trigonometry relies upon triangles which always have three straight line edges. To hammer this home, I'm going to quote uh, the wiki page on celestial navigation. Again, this is a quote from wiki. For navigation by celestial means, when on the surface of the Earth for any given instant in time, a celestial body is located directly over a single point on the Earth's surface. The latitude and longitude of that point is known as the celestial body's geographic position, or GP, the location of which can be determined from tables in the nautical or air almanac for that year. The measured angle between the celestial body and the visible horizon is directly related to the distance between the celestial body's GP and the observer's position. After some computations referred to as sight reduction, this measurement is used to plot a line of position, or LOP, on a navigational chart or plotting worksheet, the observer's position being somewhere on that line. The LOP is actually a short segment of the very large circle on Earth that surrounds the GP of the observed celestial body. An observer located anywhere on the circumference of this circle on Earth, measuring the angle of the same celestial body above the horizon at that instant of time, would observe that body to be at the same angle above the horizon. 
Sights on two celestial bodies give two such lines on the chart, intersecting at the observer's position. Actually, the two circles would result in two points of intersection arising from sights on two stars as described above, but one could be discarded since it will be very far from the estimated position acquired by dead reckoning or estimation. Most navigators will use sights of three to five stars if available, since that will result in only one common intersection and minimalizes the chance of error. That premise is the basis for the most commonly used method of celestial navigation referred to as the altitude intercept method. At least three points must be plotted. The plot intersection will usually provide a triangle where the exact position is inside of it. Accuracy of the sights is indicated by the size of the triangle. End quote. To take this a step further, whomever first established this process described must have been totally aware of the world's planar nature, to be sure. When researching who first developed celestial navigation, of course, the standard narrative is, well, it's Harry. According to the Canadian Encyclopedia on Navigation, question is, did the Greeks use celestial navigation? Answer, again, according to Canadian Encyclopedia, says, quote, Evidence suggests that the Phoenicians, the Arabs, and ancient Greeks were familiar with the use of nighttime positions of stars and constellations to aid in marine navigation, but this knowledge was lost to Europeans in the Dark Ages and only regained after about the year 1000 from the Arabs. End quote. However, when I searched the web for who invented the sextant, it yielded the result of two or even three men, John Campbell, a Royal Navy officer who died in 1790, and Sanford Lockwood Cluett, who died in 1968. Another site says the first sextant was produced by John Bird in 1759. Uh, quote, this is a very early example of his work now in the Netherlands Sheepvaart Museum in Amsterdam. The frame is mahogany with an ivory scale. It's so large and heavy that it needed a support that fitted into a socket on the observer's belt." End quote. So yet again, we find very unclear answers to a rather straightforward question. Who invented the sextant? If the sextant was first invented in the 1700s, according to one source, then how was such technology available to the ancients who ostensibly invented this process involved with celestial navigation? I doubt we'll ever have straightforward answers to many of these questions, but one thing we know for sure is celestial navigation only works on flat earth, couldn't possibly work on a globe, and the people who invented celestial navigation and the people who invented sextants must have known the truth. Thanks so much for watching guys, hope you enjoyed it. One love, cheers, and God bless.